Catterskill Falls, all the signs around you to remind you of everybody that dies and don't go over the fence. And so it was a real dangerous thing, but they made this beautiful platform. So now kids and you can go safely and, uh, and just be at the edge of this massive waterfalls and looking out at the foliage, because up there it's really changed quite a bit from what we see down here in the valley. And, and uh, we're just taking some family pictures and we're taking turns and all of a sudden Jeremiah whips out of his pocket this, this iPhone 8S. And so it's, it's the big, it's the big one. Plus it's the latest thing that Apple's come out with on their iPhone line. And this is amazing thing. And the, and the photographs that takes on portrait mode are just absolutely stunning. I know we've got photographers here and uh, sorry, Alice, I know you do some great work, but I mean, this thing is amazing. Just, just out of pocket, boom, snap a picture. And it just looks like something off a calendar, you know, back when you used to buy calendars because you didn't have a phone to tell you where the calendar was. Um, yeah, I'm really, I'm dating myself here, I guess. But the fact is, it's just amazing. And I got a little jealous. I'm thinking, I got an old Samsung. I might even have an Apple. I got a Samsung uh, S5 or something like that, which in the, back in the day was, was an amazing phone. I mean, it beat, it beat my wife's uh, iPhone 5 uh, with picture quality. But anyways, um, you know, just getting into this comparison thing. But I, I just recognize, you know, there's some folks that maybe you've never even gotten a, a cell phone yet? Or if you got a cell phone, you just still got the dumb phone, you didn't migrate or uh, uh, graduate to the to the smartphone. Uh, but I would just say, you know, I got my Y chromosome from a guy that uh, still doesn't have a cell phone at all. Not even a dumb phone. Like, he's amazing how he's dodged this whole thing. And I, but he's got my mom with one, so she's able to to uh, you know, kind of find find where they're going when he doesn't know where he's supposed to be going, and and uh, set the calendar and all that stuff that he doesn't want to have to deal with. So she just does it for him. Uh, she's got the smartphone, uh, but I just began to think about if he went out right now and just decided to buy what the latest thing was out there, having never even had a phone at all, he would jump right into the 8s. He would be handed an 8 an 8s phone, which is just stunning what it can do with videos and pictures and and the memory with 256 gigabytes on a phone. I mean, it's just stunning what you can fit in your pocket back not 10 years ago, you know, to just buy a megabyte of data and store it someplace was a cost of fortune. And uh, so now we've got 256 of them just in your pocket. And uh, it's just amazing. He would jump in and just put that in his pocket and think nothing of it. Yeah, I got an 8S, whatever. Uh, uh, it is what it is because he, he, he jumped over all that stuff. Remember Blackberry? Remember, remember the little dot on the middle of a BlackBerry phone that you had to try to get unstuck and the thing would not, the cursor wouldn't move across the screen. That was once a smartphone. Now we would consider it the most ant antiquated thing. They would just be a total dumb phone. But I mean, where, he, he bypassed all that. He wasn't in the game for all that. It's easy for folks sometimes with, the, with, with finances to feel like you get into comparison and you feel like, well, I've just always given this amount or I've never really seen the church as someplace where I want to invest my money into. I would say, why not? It's the kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom of God. It's not a pastor. It's not King's Fire Church. It's a global kingdom that has a message that needs to be heard by everyone. Jesus is coming back when the message has been preached to the corners of the earth. That's what he said. But it takes, you know, airplanes don't fly you for free just because you got a great message. You want to go help somebody. You know, try selling that at the ticket counter. No, I'm going to help people. Just let me on the plane. You don't need to charge me. It doesn't work that way. There's substance that's required for us to fulfill the commission that the Lord has for us. And so whether you're just getting in now, whether you've sat in church for a while but never thought you should include yourself. I'm not saying this because we need your money. I'm saying this because you need to be part of the kingdom that ultimately is going to be the lighthouse that this world needs in this last day as we see it just getting darker and darker. And don't worry about just jumping in and getting the same blessing. And don't judge those other people that seem to just, it's easy for them, it seems like. You know, you're putting in your amount, they're putting in thousands, and you think, well, what's mine compared to theirs? Don't do that. Jesus said, don't do that. You miss the blessing. What happens when you do that is you look at the small that you have, and rather than bless it, the way Jesus blessed the loaves and the fish. You remember the story of the feeding of 5,000? It was just a little tiny bit. Rather than say, this is just a joke. You guys are expecting me to feed 5,000 people with this tiny bit. Rather, what did he do? He blessed it. He gave thanks for it. And he began to break it and spread it out. And all of a sudden, God moved on what he blessed rather than complaining about what he didn't have. And if you get into comparison, you know, this economy in the West is built on comparison. I don't have what the Joneses have, so I'm going to go take a loan out to get the car. That's at least this. that's how we've been programmed to live. The kingdom should never be like that. You give what the Lord is showing you. You serve. We're, Joe DeSico is just back. I'm so blessed by him. If you've never done a, a, a in, in, in country mission to just go and help people that were flooded out or hit by a tornado or or hurricanes and whatever. Just Joe, could you just stand for a second? He's back from being away for a few weeks. Joe's retired. Thanks, Joe. So I don't mean to put you on the spot. I don't do that just to puff his head up. Um, but, uh, he can handle it. He's a humble guy. But just so that you know who to talk to, if you, if you just feel like you've never gone outside of yourself because you thought what you had was too small, I tell you, when folks are just trying to get their house cleaned out of all the mold and the mess and the furniture, just a pair of willing hands with gloves is an angel from heaven for them. 
And that's what he's experienced, and he's retired now, but he goes and he does this once in a while. And just when he comes back, his heart's so full. I love to see that. If there's anybody else that wants to just pursue that direction, I'm just going to point you to Joe. He's easy to find. He's on our, our host team, our usher team, and even does some security sometimes. So he'll, you'll see him in a black shirt. It says King's Fire. Just tap him and say, could you meet with me and just talk about how we can get this uh, moving? I feel like I need to be useful. But it's too many times we don't get involved, we don't sign up because it just seems like, well, what I bring to the table isn't as much or as significant as what the pastor or the other you know, people that I see on the stage bring. Just want to break that this morning. Bring to the Lord this morning in, in the offering whatever he's showing you to bring. Large or small, if it's got a bunch of zeros on the end of that check, we love those too. Uh, after there's at least some, uh, what is that called, accounting number or whatever, the whole, a whole integer. You know, put one of those first and then some zeros, but uh, not just zeros. Um, I could already see some of the tricky people. I put all the zeros on there. I filled it with zeros. Yeah, put a one in front of those and then uh, we'll be good. Um, but just want to encourage you, don't, don't fall into comparison. Because the kingdom, Jesus looked over an offering one time and a widow came and just gave a coin. But it was all that she had. And he said she gave more than all the wealthy landowners that were coming in and dropping their 10% in their offerings in the temple. I just feel like the Lord's calling us, not just in the offering, but in our time. If you've got a minute, pick up the phone, spend that minute encouraging somebody. Don't think what difference does a minute make. You'd be shocked how much you can encourage someone with a text if the Lord puts them on your heart. Let's just begin to give again. Let's begin to not compare ourselves to what other people are doing. Let's just be honest and, and, and obedient to what the Lord wants us to do with our time and our resources. As the ushers come, I'm just going to ask a quick uh, prayer. Say a quick prayer over this offering. Father, I thank you this morning. As we give, we don't just give uh, to this church or to the ministry and, and even just to your kingdom, but we give to you. We bring this before you, Lord, because you have won our hearts. You have paid a price for us. That we could never repay you. We don't try to give to repay what you've done. But we give out of a gratitude in a sense that if we'll just bless and not complain about what it is that we do have to bring. That you will expand it. You will enlarge it. You will multiply it. And you'll give us the peace that comes when we know we're in the center of your will. And we're supplying for those needs that need to be met in this world and in our neighborhoods. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Go ahead. And um, I just... Uh, want to be able to introduce to you this morning uh, the wife Jeremiah Bowser Courtney Bowser they have an amazing family they're with us for a few days and we've just had the privilege of of having a Friday night worship meeting here that was absolutely amazing and uh, we had a little worship time in our living room yesterday up on the hill and just some of the worship team came over and just the richness of who God is in them you know you'll have a unique way that you're going to express who God is in you to the people that are around you and when you just bring that and you're just honest and true to that you let the Lord just move through you I mean what was accomplished just on a couple guitars in the living room and and some folks just sitting around in that atmosphere for well over an hour and uh, people came people left but there was just such a richness and I just want to encourage us this morning as we receive this word from Courtney that uh the, the, the spirit is so rich in them and I just know that they're part of our tribe they're part of our people they resonate with us when we spend time with them. I always leave feeling so encouraged and refreshed and our vision expands from being with them. And uh, I just want you to know they're a great blessing to our family personally, but they are part of, of the legacy that Pastor Vaughn Gerald has left with us here at King's Fire Church, that he didn't just leave us great teachings and great messages and, and a book even and some great CDs. He left us a connection to all the friends that he had developed over years of traveling to over 80 nations in this world, ministering the gospel, prophesying, speaking life over people. And uh, these, are, these are part of that legacy. These, this couple and this family is part of that legacy of folks that uh, we know because of Pastor Vaughn and his obedience to the call of God on his life. And so we're just so grateful that they, they, we've only known them you know, for several years, but we just feel like we've, we've grown up together almost in the way that we see ministry, the way that we love to share time together and worship together. So after uh, that, I'm just going to welcome uh, Courtney up here. We're going to grab a podium for her and I just give her full liberty to say whatever the Lord gives her to say. Good morning. Uh, it's so good to be with you guys. Like Josh was saying, it feels like family. I mean, we've known the Gerald family. I guess Alice and I met when I was about 18, and, and Vaughn was always such a massive voice in all of our lives. And, uh, and through him, we got to connect with Josh and Elaine many years ago, and it just became family. And so it's nice because we travel a lot. And when we come here, it's like, oh, well, we're just going to visit our friends. <laughs> you know, like it doesn't feel like a, a ministry trip or you're meeting, you know, it just feels like all of our friends. And so it's so nice. So last Monday I got home and we had actually been in Boston ministering in a church last weekend and flew in at like one o'clock in the morning on Monday. And 
later that day, I was just switching focus, you know, like we're done with Boston. We're getting ready to go to King's Fire in a couple of days. Like, Lord, what do you want to do? And I was just kind of out running, thinking and praying. And all of a sudden I was running up this one road and I just heard, stay the course. And I said, okay, is that, is that what you're wanting the message you're wanting us to bring this weekend? Stay the course. And that, that phrase has been really pivotal in my walk with the Lord. I cannot tell you the number of times that the Lord has spoken to me, stay the course. I think the first time was in like 2005 or 2007. I don't know, sometime. <laughs> and I was, I was supposed to be going back to Brazil on a trip and my passport was lost. And the, the Miami consulate didn't know where it was. I didn't know where it was. We were supposed to be leaving in three days. There's no passport. There's no visa. There's no anything. And I had been really, really ill all of a sudden. I was, they were doing MRIs on my brain. There was just a lot of craziness going on. And I remember just stopping for a second and I was laying in my bed and I was like, what do you, what, what am I supposed to do, Jesus? Like the doctors are saying, don't go because we don't know what's wrong with your brain and you've got blurred vision and there's no passport and this is crazy. What do I do? And I just sat there quiet for a minute and I just heard so strong, stay the course. I was like, okay, Jesus, I'm packing bags. So literally we're packing bags. We're doing no passport still. And we're just in faith, like getting ready, get the kids ready, like everything. It's the morning we're supposed to leave. It's like our flight leaves at like 930. At this point, Jeremiah has visited the post office so often that he now has the private cell phone number of the manager of the post office. <laughs> and he has like made a deal. He's like, do not let that thing, if it comes somehow, do not let it get on a truck. Like you have to call me and I'll never forget. Like literally we were supposed to be at the airport in less than an hour and his cell phone rings. And he's like, I've got it, I've got a passport. And so he raced to the post office, grabbed the passport, we threw the bags in the car, and we raced to the, to the airport. Stay the course. And I feel, I don't know if I'll ever speak this message again, probably, maybe somewhere, but I feel like it is for King's Fire Church this morning. So I came back from that run and I looked it up. I know it's a battle term, it's a war term, but I went and looked up the definition, you know, Google. And it said, to pursue a goal regardless of obstacles or criticism to continue in what you are pursuing or planning to do until it is finished. And when I read that, I was like, oh, I know those three words. <laughs> I thought, Lord, how awesome that you laid the blueprint. You set the example for us on how to stay the course until that final moment when you hung on the cross and you breathed your last breath. You had stayed the course through thick and thin, through trials, through miracles, through it all, through the Garden of Gethsemane, which was the true battle, right? And he made it to the cross and was able to say, it is finished. I've done what I've been sent here to do. And I believe that that is what the Lord is wanting to do in each of us. I don't know where you are today, but maybe you're at a point where staying the course is debatable. <laughs> and my prayer is that by the time you leave here this morning, you will be re-solidified, re refocused, putting one foot back in front of the other again. So how do you stay the course? First, we're going to go to Psalm 27. You have to seek him. You have to seek him on the mountaintop. You have to seek him in the valley. The only safe place for you is in the seeking. I have said this most of my life. No matter what, if your theology is off, if, you're, if your choices in life are getting a little sketchy, whatever it may be, if you are seeking him, if you're putting yourself in a place where, where he can speak to you and you can hear from him, he's going to correct you. He's going to guide you. He's going to show you. Uh, and another part of Psalms, I think it's 37, he says, don't be like the horse that has to have a bridle, bridle, thank you, I'm not equestrian, has to have a bridle to be turned, have his head turned, right? But for many of us, that's how it is. Like God has to practically slap us aside the head to get us to pay attention to what he's trying to say. But he says, instead of being like the horse with the bridle, let me guide you by my eye. And what happens when we're seeking him? Then our eyes are toward to him, turned toward him above the noise, above the circumstances, above the mess. And all it takes is one glance. You know, Jeremiah can give me a look and I know he doesn't have to speak. I know what he needs. I know what he wants. I know if he's happy. I know if he's sad. I know if he's frustrated. I know. And that's how the relation. <laughs> are you messing around back there? <laughs> I can't trust him back there because I can't see what he's doing. 
And that's how the Lord wants it to be with us, you know, just a look. And we can, we can just fall into that place of staying in march with him, of letting him guide us, of keeping in pace, because we are in a battle. The minute you become a believer, you join a battle. Whether you realize it or not, which is the problem so often, right? We don't realize that there is one leading us. There is a general, a general ahead of us. And we need to stay in march with what he's doing and with his time. So the first way is that we stay the course. And in Psalm chapter 27, David, I mean, is that we keep our eyes on him. We seek him. And in Psalm 27, David lays this out for us so beautifully because he starts off saying, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? What's David doing? Like he is pre preaching to himself, right? He's speaking to himself. David was wonderful at this. He was really good at stirring his own self up throughout the Psalms. He would see things as they were. And then he would bring his spirit back to the focus that he needed to have. And that's what we have to do. It's not like, la, 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 I don't see the circumstances in my life. It's like, no, I see what's going on, but I choose to focus on something higher. I choose to believe in something higher. I choose to worship regardless. I choose to wonder and stand in awe of him regardless. And that's what David is doing here. And he goes on to say, one thing I seek. And I love this because he's just listed, like the enemies are coming out against me. Evil men plan to devour me. But one thing I'm going to ask of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in his house all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. So in his moment of, of deciding whether or not to stay the course, he brings himself back to this place of saying, no, I'm going to seek you. And I love what he says in verse eight, when he says, my heart says of you, seek his face. So your face, Lord, I will seek. For many of us today, when whatever is going on in life is, is screaming for your attention, there's that still small voice inside saying to you, seek his face. And the only response is your face, Lord, I will seek. Your face, Lord, I will seek. But then what happens? And if you jump down, you're going to see. So he's got, it's this beautiful picture of, I know I need to stay the course. I'm trying to seek him. I'm trying to remind myself, which we're going to get to in a second. And then he comes to the place where you know that there's no more decision. He's decided. He's staying the course. And in verse 13, it says, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And I picture David saying that, and then he just keeps on marching, keeps putting one foot in front of the other. Yes, Lord, what is it you want from me? The first way we stay the course is to seek him. The second way we stay the course is to remember. And I want you to go with me to Lamentations chapter three, because this is such a beautiful example of remembering. You have... <laughs> Jeremiah here and he's kind of he's he's kind of going off a little bit about all of the afflictions There's a, you know he's having a little bit of a wallowing in life and all of the difficulties and he says in verse 19 I remember my affliction and my wandering the bitterness and the gall I well remember them yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. In another version of that scripture in the New Living Translation, it says, yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. When I remember this. And about, gosh, four weeks ago now, I was walking down the, I was not walking, I was driving. <laughs> I was driving my dog to the groomer and I was sitting at a stoplight and all of a sudden I just felt like the Lord said, I want you to go back and read the last 10 years of your journals, I want you to remember and be satisfied because. And I was like, because what? <laughs> because nothing, like I got nothing else after that. So I'm an avid journaler. Like from the day I met Jesus, I had a radical encounter with Christ when I was 18 years old. And one night, everything changed. And from that moment on, I have chronicled my entire life. For those who are my long life friends, you know this about me. I, am, I journal a lot and I write down what God is doing. I write down the good, the bad, the ugly. I write down the miracles. I write down the horrific things. I write it all down. So when I die, people can read it and read the testimony of Jesus. I write down prophetic words. I write down the things that I'm praying. So I've spent the last month 
reading nothing but journals. I literally went back and found 10 years worth of journals. They're in a box next to my side of the bed. And I'm, I'm into like spring of 2014 at this point. <laughs> it's a lot of journals. But it has been the most amazing experience. Because it is this, like, this beautiful picture of the faithfulness of God. It's this beautiful picture of his never forsaking me. Even when I didn't get everything I wanted, even when every prayer wasn't answered, he was still there. He was still beautiful. And what is really truly amazing about it is there's, I have a tendency to write what I'm praying. You know, I just jot down what I'm praying each morning. And I found, I found so many prayers that were just random prayers that came out of my heart in a day and someday, you know, that now I looked back and I was like, oh my God, you did that, Lord. I would have totally forgotten that. It was just a random prayer on, you know, September 10th, 2010. And then, oh my God, you actually, you answered that prayer. And then you flip three more pages. God, you answered that prayer. I have, I have six years of prayers for the neighbors that live on the corner that now we're seeing the answers to those prayers actually happening in the last month. But it took six years of prayers before it began to happen. But it's been the most amazing thing to remember and be satisfied. And I thought it was so interesting that the Lord used that word satisfied with me because it means to be gratified to the full. In Brazil, when we finish a meal, it's really normal to say, uh, you know, eu não quero mais satisfeita, satisfeita. I'm a girl. He would say satisfeito. Like, I am satisfied. But it's like, it's a cultural thing. Like, satisfeita. And it's like this, I'm not too full. I'm not, I'm, I'm just going to be satisfied with my portion at this moment. And I think as believers, we forget to do this. I have kids <laughs> and they're amazing. But every once in a while, they drive me crazy because they are not satisfied. It's like as soon as they get the one thing they wanted, then it's on to the next thing they want. Then it's on to the next thing they want. Then they spent the afternoon with a neighbor who has this, so now they have to have that too. And it's, a real, it's actually a real battle for our boys because they travel with us all over the world. They've seen, they've been in the orphanages of Uganda. They've been in the bush of Africa. They've been all over Brazil. They've seen these things with their own eyes. And so they know they know where it falls on the totem pole, but they live in America a lot, which makes it very, it's hard raising kids in America. It is because there's this constant voice. You're not enough. You're not enough. You need this. You need that. Never enough. It's a lot of what Josh was saying in his offering message. And, and, and it can get frustrating as a parent. Like, could you just be satisfied for a moment? But how often is that what I do with the father? Instead of stopping to just remember and be satisfied with all he's done even if it's a tiny thing and you're still waiting on the miracle instead i'm like thanks but but right but what jeremiah did was he did the opposite <laughs> he said yet regardless of all these things yet this i call to mind and therefore i have hope because of the lord's great love we are not consumed for his compassions never fail they're new every morning great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. If you're in a season of waiting right now, the only hope that I know to tell you, and the only hope that there truly is, is to find your satisfaction in him as you're waiting. He's in the waiting with you. He hasn't forgotten his promises. He's in the waiting. But as you're waiting, which can be one of the hardest things to do as a believer, so many believers quit the course because of the waiting. Stay the course. When you're in the waiting, maybe that's the perfect time to find all that you need in him. For the ram in the bush, like with Abraham, to be enough, to be the provision. I know, I know about waiting. I know about holding for years and years and years, believing for something. And, and in that place, you have to ultimately come to a, a place in your heart where you say, no matter what, God, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. He's enough. He's enough. So we stay the course by seeking him. We stay the course by remembering we taste and see that the Lord is good. And that remembering brings hope. And what comes from hope but greater faith, which leads us to the third way that we stay the course. 
and that is the fight. You have to fight. You're in a battle. You have to fight. And sometimes that fighting is taking new ground, and sometimes that fighting is standing and holding the ground that you've taken. But you have to fight. We can't be apathetic Christians who just sit helplessly by as if we've not been given the tools that we need to fulfill the kingdom of God on this earth. The scriptures say that the kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. That is in the spirit realm, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers in the heavenly ways. We have to use what God has given us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We have to be willing to fight and we have to be willing to hold the ground that we gain in the spirit. I love that opening scene of Gladiator where they're, they're, they're waiting on the enemy and they're all in the line. And what's his face? Who's the Gladiator guy? Maximus. He's standing there and he's like, hold, hold. And the horses are coming and they're holding their spirits like, hold, hold. And sometimes I feel like, like the Lord is yelling that to the church, like, quit running away. Quit running away. Hold your ground. Hold your ground. Yes, I know there's all kinds of hell breaking loose all over the world. I know that even creation is groaning. We live in Florida. We've experienced the winds of some of that groaning. I know there are fires burning and there are earthquakes and devastation is happening. But I know that this is not the time for the church to turn and run. This is the time for the church to stay the course, to hold our ground because we know who we are. So let's go to Ephesians, right? We can't talk about fighting and not go to Ephesians chapter 6. Good old Paul. Ah, where'd you go, Ephesians? There you are. Verse 10, chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I love that because Paul didn't say, get stronger in your faith. Be a better Christian. You should be able to do this better than you're doing this. He said, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. He learned that lesson in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, right? When Paul was saying, please take this from me. Take this from me. It's too much. And he said, ah, but I'm strong in your weaknesses. You know, where you're weak, I'm going to come in and I'm going to fill it with my strength. And so often we're like trying to make ourselves something. I just, I, I like to say this everywhere I go. Can I just like free you from this religious mentality that somehow you can make yourself some great spiritual Christian? Like only the Holy Spirit can do that in you. You can make the choice to seek him, but you can't change yourself. But you can get in his face and let him change you and let his spirit change you. And the greater knowledge of who he is change you and fill you and use you. And you'll find that even with all your weaknesses, when you step into the anointing in that right place and you understand who lives on the inside of you and the spirit that you walk in, then his strength becomes your strength right when you need it. I can't tell you the number of times and situations that we have been in all over the world where I, I felt nothing. I felt nothing but fear and trepidation. And then I began to remember, I know who you are. I know what you've done for me. I know who lives on the inside of me and quoting the scriptures that he's planted in my heart. And then all of a sudden it was no longer Courtney in that situation, but it was the Holy Spirit. And at that point, nothing was impossible. Nothing could intimidate me in that moment because it was the spirit of God. And it wasn't about me and what I was capable of. I love that song with Brian and Katie Torob. You know, when you walk into the room, everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring. But when I sing that song, I don't think about Jesus. I think about y'all. I think about me. When we walk into the room, if we believe what we say, we believe y'all. If we believe that when we come to accept Christ and the spirit of God lives inside of us, the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations, Christ in you, the hope of glory. If that is what you believe, then when you walk in the room, if you are aware of what you carry, then everything changes and darkness starts to tremble just because you're there. I'm telling you, we've seen it happen. Just because you're there, you don't even know. I can remember being 20 years old in a male military prison in Brazil, scared out of my mind because I thought they were taking me to a female prison. Instead, they're taking me to a military prison full of men that have done terrible things, <laughs> but they're trained killers because they're in the military and I'm supposed to preach to them. And I remember standing there terrified, terrified in my little 20 year old self in this Brazilian 
prison. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord was like, it's not about you. Let me rise up. Let me rise up. Let me rise up. And he did. And like 20 men gave their lives to the Lord that night. It was crazy. But sometimes we have to remember what he has done. And Jeremiah and I wanted to share some of these stories with you about, you know, this church, you guys are family to us. We all, we said this to someone just recently. I said, they said, you know, in, in the States, because you're overseas so much in the States, like, what do you, where do you like to be and whatever? And we said, we're probably most, we feel most ourselves and able to be like ourselves up at this, this church up in Kingston, New York called King's Fire. And, and we love that. We love that we can be ourselves here. And thank you for that. But this church has also just been a, a major support to us emotionally, spiritually, financially. So all the things that we do in the nations, you guys have seed in that. You guys have seed in everything that we're doing. So when we were here last time, we were getting ready to leave in Por to Portugal and France. I don't know if you remember when we were here in March, we were getting ready to leave for Portugal and France. And the France thing was a real crazy story because we had been in Brazil the September prior and driving in a car and just felt like God said, I'm sending you to France, go. And we were like, well, we need a plane. Like what city do we buy a plane ticket to, you know? And so God had kind of connected us with a girl who knew these older pastors in this tiny town. Like it's crazy, crazy stories, right? I might've said some of that last time we were here. So we find ourselves in France meeting these people that we've only seen a picture of on Facebook, right? And Jeremiah mentioned this Friday night, like it was kind of a blurry Facebook picture. If it weren't for the guy is like 81 years old and has a full head of gray hair and beard. And we we're like, that probably is him. Like, I think that's, and Jeremy did one of these kind of like, and they kind of waved back and, but they looked like, like the husband especially looked like they were like mad that we were there. <laughs> and so I remember us both getting in the car thinking, what have we done? Like, maybe this was a really bad idea. <laughs> Why are we here? They look angry that they, they have us here. And I just felt the Lord like, just stay the course. Don't start freaking out now. You got this far, like just stay the course, you know? And then, oh man, I can't even tell you like 48 hours of beautiful Jesus, miraculous me translating for us because I didn't speak a lick of English. And God just doing the most amazing, beautiful things that we will never forget and that we feel like is the beginning of a lot of future ministry in France in a nation where this couple, probably the biggest their church ever was, was maybe 30 people. And now it's down to eight because that is really indicative of the spiritual climate in France right now. But God all over Europe is creating these little pockets of fire that I think are getting ready to explode. And God is getting ready to do something amazing there. And we are going to be a part of it in France at least. And believe that through us, this church will also be a part of it. And maybe some of y'all just come with us. And, and France and plowing the ground and in France and redigging those wells, not just with the French, but with all of the Muslim immigrants there as well, which is a whole nother mission field there. And then after that, we went to Uganda the next month and we did the love project that we do with the orphanage that we've worked with for like seven years now in Uganda. So it's been so beautiful because we build relationships with these kids and we've gotten to watch them grow. And this time we did something that we haven't done necessarily in this way before. And in between all the arts, so we, in, in, with the Love Project, we teach the arts, right? Dance, drama, music, visual arts, all of that. And we use it to outreach to their communities and we train them up to do it. But this time we did a lot of ministry training with them. So we sat with them and we taught these kids. Now these kids, you gotta know, like their stories would, would make you weep, right? Like their stories are horrendous, but man, they have been captured by Jesus. And they, I mean, you sit there and you talk to them about praying for people and being brave to, to talk with someone and share Jesus about the gifts of the spirit. We taught them about the gifts of the spirit and the prophetic and how to prophesy over people and listen for the voice of the Lord. And they practiced it on each other. Like we actually had them practice it before the, the outreach. We taught them how to get up and share about Jesus, how to tell their testimonies. And it was unbelievable. And then it was finally the day and our boys were doing it all with them, which as a mom is just the funnest thing to watch how they, every year they come back together and all their hearts are just like, they, they haven't been away from each other for a year, living the most different lives imaginable. And then they just come back together as brothers and sisters in Christ as kids and they just love each other. And so this final day of the outreach, we're in the village 
and we first arrived to this little like dirt floor tin roof place that they were allowing us to use to hold this outreach and there was like hardly anybody there and I was like man but it is it is Africa it's like Brazil nothing ever starts on time and so you just kind of wait around and we're waiting and we're waiting and within an hour they 400 or so people had walked from the surrounding villages and areas and filled that place almost a whole high school of kids had led out from the town not far and come down the dirt roads and found us and were there it was unbelievable unbelievable then after that jeremiah was in brazil he preached what seven churches in seven days seven different churches seven days leading worship and preaching and if you've ever been in like a charismatic brazilian church like a service lasts approximately four to five hours so so it's a lot of, of vocal cords but though the, toward the end of that trip he had the most amazing experience kind of a last minute sort of thing they invited him to come to this citywide gathering in the stadium and there was like 53,000 people there and he had the opportunity to lead them in worship and they sent me I was home with the boys because we were gonna cross paths and they sent me a little video while he was leading worship and there's a song he sings in Portuguese that says not a my satisfies me alma which means nothing else satis satisfies my soul soul Jesus soul Jesus only Jesus only Jesus so can you imagine 53,000 people singing not a my satisfied nothing else satisfies my soul only you jesus only you jesus it was glorious and beautiful but the lord gave us this like interesting little like juxtaposition because we crossed paths and then i went to brazil to be with our friends in hasifi that run an organization called shores of grace that works with rescuing little girls and working with women and men on the streets and working in prostitution and so I was there with them on the streets and working with these women and the girls that had been rescued and before I left I had woken up in the night and felt like I needed to pray and so I got up at like three o'clock in the morning to pray and as I was praying I had this like vision of a woman and I walked up to this woman on the street and I handed her a necklace and I gave her this necklace and I told her and I told her some word like God just gave me a word for her on the street and I gave it to her and so then I see all this in my mind while I'm sitting there praying you know and then I'm like well it's like 3 a.m. and I leave in a few hours for the airport like Walmart's open 24 hours should I drive to Walmart and see if I can find a necklace you know and I felt like the Lord was like no I'm gonna bring you the necklace and I thought well that makes it even more complicated so this is gonna be interesting and so I get up, we, we go, he takes me to the airport, I leave for his Hasifi. My friends have been ministering in another city. They arrive to pick me up and we, we go on about our way. Well, the next morning I'm having coffee with my friend Rachel. And I say, I had the weirdest thing right before I left. I felt like, you know, God was gonna bring me this necklace, blah, blah. And she interrupts me and she goes, wait, hold on, I have your necklace. And she goes running out of the room and she comes running back. And I'm like, what? And she goes, no, I gotta tell you this story. So they had just flown in from ministering in another city called Brasilia, the capital of Brazil. And at the end of their service, a woman comes from the back of the church up to Rachel, her name is Rachel, and brings her a necklace and says, God spoke to me clear as day, I have to give you this necklace. This is the perfect example of our little steps of obedience and the, the stories that God can link together. So she hands Rachel this necklace that says Carol. And Rachel's like, Thank you so much for a necklace that says Carol. <laughs> this is wonderful. And Nick's like, just take it. Who knows what'll come of it? So then the next day, she's sitting having coffee with me and she's like, oh my God, the Carol necklace is for Courtney. So she gives me the necklace. I keep it in my pocket. Every day I'm looking for Carol. Where's Carol? Where else Carol? I'm like introducing everyone. Qual es el nome? Which is just asking what's your name, you know? No Carols. Every time I'm on the streets, no carols. Every time I'm with the Bethany girls, no carols. No carols anywhere. At this point, I'm about to like go through the supermarket like, what's your name? What's your name? You know, no carols anywhere. So then we get to the end of the week. It's my last night of ministry there and they do something called the Father's Love Banquet. So the teams and myself and others had spent the last week canvassing the streets where the women work and the men, inviting them to this banquet on Friday night. And Shores of Grace puts on this beautiful banquet for these women. And it's a five course meal in a, in a hotel not far from the Avenida where they all work. And they just lay it all out for them and pour out the love of God on these women. And so it's the time for the banquet. Most of the women are already there. 
and they've had their meals and we're getting ready to start the service part. And all of a sudden, I still haven't met a Carol. Like I've introduced myself to everyone in the room and there's no Carol. And all of a sudden these four women come walking in and they pass all these other tables, walk all the way across the room to my table and sit down. And one of them looked really angry and intimidating and like someone I would probably very much steer clear of trying to have a conversation with because she looked like she hated me from the moment she saw me, you know? But I'm sitting there and I'm trying to introduce myself real quick before the worship begins and I go through the three women and then I say to the woman that appears to hate me, <laughs> what is your name? And she says, Carol. And I'm like, of course you're the Carol. <laughs> of course. Isn't that how it always works, God? <laughs> And so they start worship, and I'm like, God, what do I do? And he said, start with Carol, because I was the speaker for the evening. So when they're done with worship, Nick passes it to me. And I, be, I just got up, and I started to tell this story, but I never said the name, you know? And I just started to tell this story of what God does for the one and how much he sees the one and these beautiful stories that, that though Jeremiah got to stand in the, you know, this beautiful glory of all these 53,000 people singing the name of God and crying out for him, but that he sees every single one. And he had spoken to one of the ones in Brasilia and had her give her necklace. And then he had spoken to one in Jacksonville, Florida and said, be looking for a necklace. And then he had one in between. You see all the pieces? And then, so I'm telling this whole story and I walk over to her and by now she looks terrified of me. <laughs> and I just drop the necklace in her hand. I said, what does that say? And of course she sees Carol and she just begins to weep and weep and weep. And then, you know, the presence of God, the love and intimacy of God. You know, it was Hagar out in the desert who named God, you are the God who sees me. When she felt alone and abandoned and unwanted, she said, now I know there is a God who sees me. It's one of my favorite names for the Lord of all the things people call him in the Bible, the God who sees me. So how do you stay the course? <laughs> you seek him. You remember stories like what I just told you in your own life, because you know you all have just as many stories of his faithfulness to you. And you're satisfied and you're thankful and grateful. You stand, you fight, <laughs> you pray. You've got to pray, you guys. You've got to use the word of God. If we go on in the book of Ephesians, you'll see he tells us, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I said in the first service, and I'll say it again, one of the things, the, one of the many things that Von Gerald instilled in Jeremiah and I was the necessity to love and eat this Bible. To, to read it, to pray. Like I tell this to, to young kids and 89 year olds alike. <laughs> if you don't like reading the Bible, instead of making some big deal about it, just take 10 minutes, sit down, open the Bible, say, God, I don't like reading this. It doesn't do anything for me. I don't get it. I don't understand it. It's boring to me, whatever it feels like to you. I fall asleep within the first three sentences, whatever. Just tell him. And then would you just ask him, say, Holy Spirit, I can't make this awesome for me, but you can. So would you please like make something come alive to me in the scriptures today? Make something stand out to me in these scriptures today. And before you know it, if you will keep praying that, maybe that day it's just one little thing, one little thing that happens to resonate in your heart. But then maybe the next day you find yourself enjoying that scripture so much that then you've gone to look up what the reference for that scripture is. And then that's led you to another thing. And then you're reading a whole chapter in 1 Samuel that references from a chapter in Matthew. Like it's crazy. It's like you're digging through all these treasures and you don't even realize it. So I just encourage you, just pray it every time. Like God, breathe on this, make it be real, make it come alive. And I promise you it will. And that's why Paul said, you have to use it as the sword of the spirit. But then he goes on in verse, I think 18, can't really read that. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the saints. Pray, pray and pray some more. Pray in the spirit, pray in English, pray in any other language you speak, I don't care, but pray. Pray while you're doing the dishes, pray while you're driving the car, pray, pray, and you will see those prayers begin to make a difference. Don't be afraid to pray big, for big prayers. Pray the prayers for specific people like your neighbors around the corner, but pray.
pray the big prayers like hurricanes changing course and fires stopping and, and, and all, you know what I mean? Like sometimes we think, well, that's too big. I can't pray for human trafficking because it's too big. Yes, you can. Yes, you can, because you've got to know who you serve. You've got to know the God that you, that you trust in, the God that you believe. Write them down. Write what you pray. And you'll start to see it happen. But why? Why do you do this? What is the point in even staying the course? Why? Right? It comes in the next verse. Paul writes, pray also for me. Now this is, this is from a man that has been beaten, he's been tortured, he's been shipwrecked, he's been forsaken, he's been betrayed. Like, the story of Paul is not necessarily an easy one, but it's one we're still talking about. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, oh, I love this, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Basically, he's saying, Pray that I'll stay the course. Pray that I'll stay the course. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So I feel like this is one of many times if you study the life of Paul. Philippians 1 is another time where Paul was like, I got to stay the course. I got to stay the course. And he wavers for a second, but I got to stay the course, right? But then you get to see you get to see Paul at his, it is finished. You get to see Paul after he has stayed the course. And there's so many lives that have been impacted. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. He's at the end now. He has stayed the course, and he knows his time is up. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not just to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I think that what Paul was seeing in this moment is not, it's because I have stayed the course, because I fought the fight, I am now in this final moment like Jesus was where he says, okay, I'm finished. I've done it. I ran a good race. And it's not just me that's going to be receiving the reward when I see the Father smiling at me face to face. But there's going to be all these other ones behind me. All these other ones. Because of the life that he lived. Because of the, the willingness to stay the course every other time. God is wanting to write an unbelievable story through your life. And just in that moment when you want to give up and you say, I can't do this anymore, hear him saying, stay the course. Because most often on the other side of that is a story that will resonate with people and cause them to see God and to understand his love in a way that they would have never known unless you had stayed the course. Unless you had been willing to do what was necessary so that you could have that testimony. What does the revelation say? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Jesus did his part, right? He provided the blood. We provide the testimonies. How do we provide the testimonies? By staying the course. Don't you dare give up. Don't you dare give up. He is faithful. Seek him. Remember his goodness to you. Build your hope and build your faith. Hold that ground. Fight when is necessary. Pray. Dig into this word. Use it. And everywhere that you go, remember that light and love comes crashing in with you. Christ in you. You carry it with you everywhere you go. When you go to lunch today, something walks into that restaurant with you. The only difference is whether or not you're aware of it. But if you walk in knowing, we got in an Uber the other day that was like, it felt like we walked into hell for a second. And I don't know what was going on in the, with that driver and that Uber and everything. But I was like, good Lord, there's like 80 million demons in this car. And for a minute, I felt super intimidated. And then all of a sudden, there was just this little like inside of me. I can sometimes get a little feisty, in case you didn't notice. And I was like, no, I will not be intimidated. I care what kind of demonic junk's going on with this dude and the people that were in this car before us I know who I am and I was like oh god just give me a word for him just give me a word for him I know in one moment we can break all this off of him come on Jesus but you know what I mean that is who you are that is who you are whether it's with your neighbor that you're just being kind to and loving them well so when they're you know all hell is breaking loose you're the one who gets the phone call 
way is not working anymore, but you've always shown me love, and I know what you stand for. Help. Help. And you're like, yeah, come on. I love you. The love of God is beautiful. It's beautiful. And we rec- when we recognize the way he sees people, ah, it changes everything. The carols are waiting for you. Yeah. Okay. Can I pray for you? Father, I thank you for every person in this room. I pray, Holy Spirit, that we would get what we need to get from you this morning, God. That each of us would remember whatever we're meant to remember from this this morning, Jesus. And that it would plant and root so deeply in our hearts that it could not return void, Father, but that it would multiply and grow fruit in our lives, God. That nothing would be able to steal, Lord Jesus, what you're doing in our hearts this morning. But as the body of Christ, we would rise up in the love and in the power and in the might of our Savior, God. And we would stay the course to see your kingdom come on the earth, God. To see the carols of the world. Recognize your love for them, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Keep our hearts real. Keep your grace flowing. You bring it on spine. You bring in a soul to an unswerving faith in the power of your name. A heart beating for your kingdom to reign. 